June in northern Michigan is a time that residents look forward to all year. The harsh days of winter have gone, the mud and rain of spring are mostly behind us, and summer has reared her beautiful face. For 15-year-old Melissa Simmons of Scottville, Michigan, the summer of 1993 was full of promise. She just finished her freshman year at Mason County Central High School and started a new summer job at the Blue Lake Resort. Wednesday, June 23rd had been warm and sunny, reaching in the upwards of 80 degrees during the day. The warmth lingered that evening with temperatures hovering in the 60s. Melissa, Missy to her family and friends, left her parents' home to walk to a friend's house a few blocks away. More than a week later, Melissa's decomposing body would be found floating in the Père Marquette River. Just three days after the discovery of her body, more than 50,000 people would flood into Ludington, Michigan, just miles from Melissa's home, to celebrate the 4th of July, watch the parade, and the evening fireworks. This month marks 27 years since the unsolved murder of Melissa Simmons. Welcome to Bitter Endings, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, J.R. Erickson. In Bitter Endings, I'll bring you stories of those taken too soon, the silent many who no longer have a voice through which to seek justice. The Bitter Endings podcast is sponsored by my fiction novels, the Northern Michigan Asylum series are novels that braid elements of haunting and murder mystery, and they're all inspired by a real former asylum here in Traverse City, Michigan, which is where I live. You can find the novels on Amazon.com in audio format if you are an Audible listener, as well as in ebook and paperback. Scottville, Michigan in Mason County is a small city on the northwest side of the state. Originally inhabited by Native Americans, fur traders, hunters, and fishermen, it later became occupied by white settlers in the late 1800s who were drawn to the dense forests and prospects for lumber. People were also attracted to the area for the river, later named the Père Marquette River. It was originally named not a Pico Gone by the Native Americans, which translated to, quote, a river with heads on sticks, which I must admit is rather creepy. According to the 2000 census, Scottville had a population of 1,266 people. The primary economic supports are agriculture and tourism, and I think we need to pay special attention to tourism here. For anyone not from Michigan, you may not realize how small towns and cities swell in the summer when tourists flood in from downstate and out of state, drawn to the beaches and forests of northern Michigan. As a Michigan resident who lived up north in the summer myself, I remember what a stark contrast existed between a northern Michigan town in January compared to June. The population swell by the thousands. People come to stay at their summer homes or to camp and stay in motels and hotels. Scottville is just nine miles east of Ludington, which is on the shores of Lake Michigan and is a popular tourist destination, especially in the weeks before the 4th of July, the same time Melissa Simmons disappeared. But let me take a step back so we can talk about Melissa herself. Melissa Marie Simmons was born December 26, 1977, in Wichita, Kansas, to father Albert F. Simmons and mother Vesta Simmons. She had two biological siblings, a sister, Anita, and a brother, Chester. Her family was Catholic, and she was baptized in St. Margaret Mary's Catholic Church. Vesta and Albert divorced when the children were young, and Albert remarried a woman named Rosemary. Melissa, Anita, and Chester grew up living with their father and their stepmother. 
first in Wichita and later in Scottville, Michigan, where they moved in June of 1988. Melissa was a pretty young woman, standing 5 foot 4 inches tall and weighing 110 pounds. She had medium length blonde hair and blue eyes. She attended Mason County Central High School, where she enjoyed seeing her friends and attending school dances. She'd just completed her freshman year at the time of her death and was looking forward to her sophomore year. She'd also recently started a job at the Blue Lake Resort in Fountain, where she worked Saturdays, raking leaves, straightening up rooms, cleaning, and doing odd jobs. The Blue Lake Resort is a family-owned resort that consists of log cabins on a small, private lake. Melissa also occasionally worked as a babysitter. Although I didn't find a great deal about her family, I read that in addition to her biological siblings, Melissa had four half-brothers, a stepbrother, and a stepsister. So let's step back in time to a warm night in the exhilarating days of summer in northern Michigan, when life for 15-year-old Melissa Simmons was filled with possibility. Around 9.45 p.m. Wednesday, June 23rd, Melissa was sitting in the living room of her Scottville home with her stepmother, Rosemary, and possibly her dad, although I read one article that stated Albert was out of town the night she disappeared. Wearing light-colored jeans, a white blouse, a gold necklace, and a pair of white sneakers, Melissa said she was going to walk to a friend's house a few blocks away. She stepped through the door and into the night, leaving her family home for the last time. Melissa's next steps are unclear, but we know she arrived at the Wesco station, a gas station and convenience store not far from her home with two teenage girls around 10 p.m. She may have purchased a pop. This is the last confirmed sighting of Melissa Simmons alive. A July 1993 article in the Ludington Daily News mentioned that Melissa may have been spotted with three teen boys the night she disappeared at Spartan West Bowling Alley. However, I didn't find this substantiated anywhere else. In the days following Melissa's disappearance, her family didn't immediately panic. It's summer in northern Michigan, and as a teen in those days myself, I remember the freedom, especially in northern Michigan towns. Everyone felt safe. You might go off and stay at a friend's, or in my case, I might have gone off and stayed at a cousin's. And again, if Albert, Melissa's dad, was out of town, her coming home might have been even less strange because perhaps she had more lax rules when her dad wasn't there. Again, though, this is just speculation on my part. Rosemary, Melissa's stepmother, did say that a day or two after Melissa vanished, the family became frantic. Rosemary took time off of work to create flyers and hand them out around town, but there was no sign of Melissa. Several days after she disappeared, the Simmons family reported her missing to the police. The Saturday after Melissa vanished, Debbie Woodard of the Blue Lake Resort received a call from Melissa's family inquiring whether she arrived for work. Debbie told the caller she had not. On July 1, 1993, eight days after Melissa vanished, a man fishing on the Pear Marquette River near the Indian Bridge on Reek Road spotted a body in the water. Reports differed on whether the man was in a canoe or a kayak, the body was the partially clad, decomposed corpse of a teenage girl. Melissa Simmons had been found. Police were summoned and divers went into the water to retrieve the body. After they pulled her out, they continued to comb the river for hours, searching for any additional evidence in the water and along the banks. The body was taken to Bloodgate Memorial Medical Center in Grand Rapids, where her autopsy was performed. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, Melissa was identified through dental records and jewelry. The coroner concluded Melissa likely died the day she was last seen or shortly thereafter. He also said that it did not appear to be a drowning death. However, the advanced state of decay made the cause of death impossible to determine. He did list it as a homicide. 
the Mason County Sheriff's Department have never released autopsy or toxicology reports regarding Melissa's death. Investigators immediately treated Melissa's death as a murder. The Mason County Sheriff Department and the Scottville Police Department worked jointly on the case. They interviewed Melissa's friends and family and traced the final hours of her life, but they came to a dead end after the sighting at the Wesco station. I do wonder if the teen girls that Melissa was with that night were ever questioned. I'm assuming they must have been since there didn't seem to be any calls for the girls who'd been with her to come forward. Usually you'd see reports in the newspaper over the years requesting who whoever had been with her that night to, to please come forward and tell the police what they know. Still, I am curious if they were questioned what they said about Melissa's plans for the evening. If she walked away from the gas station saying she was heading home, if she told them she was going to meet someone. And none of that information was available in any of the articles that I found about her case. The location of Melissa's body was more than six miles away from the last place she was seen, which implies someone likely drove her there. One lead included a party that was rumored to have been occurring the night Melissa vanished. The party was at Wayland Lake, which was just over a mile from where Melissa's body was found in the river. It's never been confirmed that Melissa attended the party or even that there was definitely a party. Rosemary Simmons said that the police were pretty tight-lipped about Melissa's body after her death stating only that she was wearing socks, underpants, and a bra. Since autopsy reports were never released, it's hard to say if Melissa was sexually assaulted, and in all likelihood, they couldn't tell due to the state of her body. But the lack of clothing does seem to imply some kind of sexual component in her death. In the days after the body was discovered, Scottville Sheriff Larry Stewart told people not to panic, and though they were treating the case as a homicide, there were many other possible options. He told the Ludington Daily News, quote, there's not a madman on the loose or anything like that. That's just not the case. This comment did not settle well with me when I read it. You've got a small town with just over 1,000 residents and a 15-year-old girl has been murdered and dropped in the river. I'd say that's cause for concern. And if anything, you'd want to advise people to be cautious rather than implying there's nothing to worry about. Despite the sheriff's suggestion, anxieties were heightened in the community after Melissa's death. A girl who was only five at the time, years later, would tell a news reporter that her family had often fished at the Indian Bridge, but they never went there again after Melissa's murder. Mass was held for Melissa at St. Mary's Catholic Church in Custer, Michigan. Melissa was laid to rest in the Père Marquette Cemetery in Ludington. Over 100 people were in attendance. After the murder, Mason County Central High School opened up to allow grieving students to come in and talk about the untimely death of their friend. The principal at the time, Jack Murchie, spoke with the Ludington Daily News after Melissa's death. He said, quote, I can't believe it. We had the automobile accident, then this. It's tough. The previous February, several Scottville students were involved in a car crash and two of those students died. The third was injured. Murchie described Melissa as a nice young girl, always the type of kid that had a smile on her face. She always attended school. She liked school and school liked her. If the case was ever warm, it soon grew cold. The river had destroyed much of the evidence and whatever else the police had learned about the night Melissa vanished, they kept quiet. In the weeks following her murder, suspicion may have fallen on her family. In an article in the Ludington Daily News six weeks after her death, Mitchell Oakes, the husband of Missy's stepsister Lisa, told police, quote, stop coming back and treating us as suspects. Show us a little common courtesy and lay off this family. He was apparently frustrated that the family of Melissa was being questioned whenever they asked for progress on the case. 
In a June 1994 article about the case, Melissa's sister Anita said it will be a miracle if they ever find out what happened to her sister. She said she believed knowing what happened would help give her peace of mind and help her get over Melissa's death. Anita said, quote, not a minute goes by that I don't think about it and wonder what took place. What went so bad that it had to come to a death? It's really frustrating. In the same article, Melissa's stepmother, Rosemary, said, quote, it hasn't been an easy year for any of us, but it's even worse that there's no one in jail. In the years following Melissa's death, her father posted a cross bearing Melissa's name at the place near Indian Bridge on South Reek Road where her body was discovered. Each year, he said the cross had been destroyed or vandalized. In 2003, 10 years after her murder, he erected cross number eight, this one made of steel, Melissa's name welded onto it. It was cemented into the ground. Though Albert puts up a cross each year, he told the Ludington Daily News he mostly talked to Missy at her grave. He said he knew she was with God. In a later interview in 2017, Albert's anger flared up when he spoke about the man who murdered his daughter. He said, quote, the low-life piece of trash that took her life as far as I'm concerned, is on his way to where the sun don't shine and where the fires burn from the toes to his nose. Melissa's dad, Albert, died last year at the age of 80 on February 13th, 2019. He went to his grave not knowing what happened to his murdered daughter. Throughout the years, many tips have come in regarding Melissa's case. However, little has been released to the public. At the time of Melissa's death, Sheriff Stewart said they'd considered a range of theories. Maybe she got tangled up with some young men in the community. Perhaps someone in her family had been involved, though that lead went nowhere. Investigations took them outside of Mason County and even outside of Michigan. They received a lot of tips with people who had second, third, and even fourth-hand information. In an article early in the case, the sheriff mentioned how difficult a murder investigation becomes to solve after the 72-hour mark. And in Melissa's case, investigators were far past 72 hours when her body was found. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about some possible suspects and theories regarding what happened. First, I find a case like this really difficult to pinpoint a who. One of the problems is we don't know how she died, if she was raped, if a terrible accident occurred and someone dumped her there. Usually the body offers some of that information and in this case it just didn't. I'm assuming even in a case where you have a decomposed body, if she had been bludgeoned and there were skull fractures, if she had been stabbed, there still would have been evidence on Melissa's skeleton and obviously they didn't find that. They also didn't find evidence of drowning or water in her lungs, um, which to me points to things like suffocation or strangulation. As I was researching the case, a couple of names came up regarding killers of young women who were active in Michigan at the time of Melissa's murder. We'll start with Dennis Bowman. Dennis Bowman's adopted daughter, 14-year-old Andrea Bowman, went missing from Hamilton, Michigan in March of 1989. Her disappearance went unsolved for three decades. In November of 2019, Dennis was arrested for the 1980 murder of Kathleen Doyle in Norfolk, Virginia. 25-year-old Kathleen was the wife of a naval officer who was out of town at the time of her murder. According to investigators, Bowman entered her home, raped, stabbed, and strangled her. Dennis was 31 at the time of the crime, and though police have not released their evidence, that ties him to the murder, they stated police work and forensics had brought the case to a close. 
According to an article on WWMT, Dennis Bowman had a history of violence. He was found guilty in 1980 of an assault in Ottawa County. Bowman drove up behind a girl riding her bicycle. He was on his motorcycle. He pulled in front of her and took out a gun. He told her to walk toward the woods or he'd blow a hole in her. A car drove by and the woman was able to escape and call police. Bowman was sentenced in 1981 to the assault and he was released from prison in 1986. A decade later, he was arrested again in 1998 for breaking and entering in Allegan County. He stole a shotgun and a duffel bag of lingerie. He was sentenced to one year in jail. So let's go back to 14-year-old Andrea Bowman, who I mentioned at the beginning of talking about Dennis Bowman. In 1989, Dennis and Andrea were living in an isolated trailer in Hamilton, Michigan, which is on the southwest side of the state. Dennis claimed that Andrea stole money from the trailer and took off. Her adopted mother searched for Andrea for years, but never found a trace of her. In 2019, after Bowman was arrested for the murder of Kathleen Doyle, investigators took a new look at the 14-year-old's disappearance. They searched Bowman's former property in Hamilton and made a chilling discovery. The skeletal remains of Andrea Bowman were located beneath a slab of concrete. So I didn't find any articles linking Bowman to Melissa Simmons. However, his name came up a couple of times on threads where people were talking about the case and talking about murderers in Michigan operating within that time frame. And obviously, this was a man who attacked and murdered women. It's not totally out of the realm of possibility since he was living in West Michigan at the time of Melissa's death. Now, the Hamilton area is a couple hours south of Scottville on the same side of the state, so along sort of the Lake Michigan shoreline area. At the time of Melissa's death, Bowman would have been in his 40s. The other thing that drew me to Bowman was the situation in 1980 where he rode up behind a girl on her bicycle and tried to force her into the woods. So clearly we're seeing an individual who is targeting young women, uh, especially in wooded or isolated areas. And it's very possible that the night Melissa was killed, that there was some point where she was walking down the street alone. Again, this is theories, speculation. I have no evidence to back this up. So another suspect who perhaps holds a bit more weight since those investigating Melissa's death have actually stated that they're looking into him as a possible person involved in her murder is Jeffrey Willis. Jeffrey Willis showed up on police radar in Michigan in 2016 after a frantic phone call from a 16-year-old girl who'd been abducted by a man in a silver minivan. The girl had accepted a ride from the man, who then pulled a gun on her. She jumped from the van and ran to a home and phoned the police. Law enforcement quickly honed in on 46-year-old Jeffrey Willis, and what they found in his van was shocking. They discovered a 22 caliber gun that they connected to the unsolved murder of 36-year-old Rebecca Bletch, who'd been shot while out for a jog in 2014. Police also discovered handcuffs, ropes, chains, rubber gloves, a ball gag, a bar with wrist restraints, and pictures of women chained and bound. So obviously their discovering the 22 caliber gun did not immediately link him to Rebecca's murder because that would have taken some time and some ballistics evidence. I think they really started to make the connection between Willis and Rebecca after they went to Jeffrey 
Jeffrey's home and they searched his home. So on his computer, they found extensive pornography in addition to a file folder labeled VIX, V-I-C-S, which I think now we can assume was short for victims. Within the folder, there were two files. One was labeled Rebecca Bletch, and the other was Jessica Hiringa. So within each of these files, there were clippings, first about the murder of Rebecca, and second about the unsolved abduction of Hiringa, who had disappeared from a Norton Shores gas station in 2013. And I actually still remember reading about Jessica's disappearance in the news. In 2013, I was just a couple of years graduated from high school. I was um, in undergrad at Michigan State. And I, I just remember seeing her picture on the news and in the newspapers. She was this beautiful young mom. She was 25 years old petite and blonde with these sparkling blue eyes. And I remember partially because of my true crime tendencies, I remember thinking how unsafe it was for a woman who looked like her and who was small to be working at a gas station overnight. And sometimes that's one of the things that is frustrating being a woman. You are automatically a target for certain kinds of people, especially in places like gas stations at night when there's no one around, or in the instances of previous cases I've talked about where women were at payphones in the middle of the night, just these isolated places where if you are a young woman, you are automatically on the radar of certain kinds of predators. Jessica had vanished without a trace, and there had been reports of a van possibly sighted at the scene, but for years nothing came out of it. In Willis's computer file, police found clippings about Jessica's disappearance. He also matched a description of a man seen in the gas station the night she was abducted. His silver van matched one caught on a security camera. Investigators also found out that Willis was scheduled to work the evening that Jessica was taken and he never showed for his shift. Willis was tried and convicted of both the murders of Rebecca and Jessica. And just kind of jumping back for a moment to the comment that I made about young women being victimized in gas stations. On December 9th, 2013, a Michigan House of Representatives bill was announced and it was called the Jessica Hiringa Act or also Jessica's Law. And Jessica's parents had requested it and it was introduced to representatives Colleen Lamont and a community member named Sharon Pinnell. Basically, Jessica's law requires gas stations and convenience stores that are open between the hours of 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. to install and maintain a security camera system. And if they do not do that, they need to have at least two employees on shift during those hours. Um, I myself personally prefer the idea of two employees on shift because for many predators, I don't know that a security camera is going to deter them when they've decided to attack someone. Although in this case, especially had a security camera been installed and Willis had been captured sooner, he would not have been able to shoot and kill Rebecca. So again, I don't know how Willis might be connected to Melissa Simmons, but there was a mention that he may have lived near Scottville previously. And also, just to put this in perspective, Muskegon, which is where Haringa and Rebecca were murdered within that vicinity. It's just over 60 miles south of Scottville on the west side of Michigan. So again, kind of off the shores of Lake Michigan. At the time of Melissa's murder, Jeffrey would have been in his early 20s. And that's an age where a lot of predators have started killing or they're at least fantasizing about killing. The other thing that I think about 
in terms of Willis as well as Bowman. Michigan is a state where people travel. A lot of people who live downstate in the Detroit area, the Lansing area, they travel up north in the summer. I grew up south of Lansing and we went up north all summer, every summer for most of my life. And now I live up north. So it's it's a very common thing for people who live in the southern part of their state to travel into the northern part of the state. And when you think back again, this is, you know, Melissa was murdered in June. She was murdered not long before the 4th of July, a time when a lot of people are traveling north. It's not at all out of the question to think that Bowman or Willis could have traveled up to Scottville around the time that she was killed. That being said, I don't know if the police have found any evidence that they actually were in Scottville the night that Melissa was murdered, but again, it was mentioned in an article that Willis is being considered as a possible suspect in Simmons' death. So the last person that I'm going to mention is a local Scottville resident, and I am not going to mention him by name. Um, his name came up in a couple of Facebook posts, and as most of us know, social media is not reliable. It cannot be considered facts, but I do like to pay attention to the names that appear, especially if they appear more than once. And there are cases where people have been murdered and the murderers were local residents and they talked about it or bragged about it for years. And it was sort of this known but not discussed aspect of the community. And then years later, it turns out those those individuals who'd been speaking about it when they were young actually were the murderers. So I'm only going to mention that this person's first initial is S. And according to the poster who mentioned this man, she claimed that he had killed Melissa, that he had confessed to her that he killed Melissa, that it was known throughout Scottville by the young people at the time of Melissa's death that this man had killed her. So according to the poster, S said that he was dating Melissa in 1993 and they got in an argument the night that she disappeared and the next thing he knew she wasn't breathing so he dumped her in the river. According to this post, multiple people knew this man killed Melissa. The police had been told and they had even implied that they had been given the name on more than one occasion. So that's that's pretty much everything that I have on the case of Melissa Simmons. And it's really unfortunate that her father died before her killer was brought to justice. There continue to be articles online and news stories about the unsolved murder of Melissa Simmons. Even within the last couple of years, there have been investigators talking about the possibility of the Michigan State Police's cold case unit eventually getting the case and, and maybe having some fresh eyes. And as we've seen in so many cases, these murders can be solved 30, 40, 50 years after they were committed. Any number of things might ultimately break open the case of Melissa Simmons. I think because it appears there is a lack of of evidence in the case, what ultimately will bring this killer to justice is someone bringing forward information. So either the killer himself or themselves, if there were more than one, or someone who knew what happened at the time and they decide to come forward. If you have any tips or information about the unsolved murder of Melissa Marie Simmons, call the Mason County Sheriff's Office at 
843-843-3475. If you have any comments or case suggestions, please send me an email at bitterendingspodcast at gmail.com. You can also find out all of the resources for this episode and read the show notes and more. Visit my website at www.bitterendingspod.com. You can also find me on Facebook at Bitter Endings Podcast. The Bitter Endings Podcast is sponsored by My Fiction Novels. The Northern Michigan Asylum series are novels that braid elements of haunting and murder mystery, and they're all inspired by a real former asylum here in Traverse City, Michigan, which is where I live. You can find the novels on Amazon.com in audio format if you are an Audible listener, as well as in ebook and paperback. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bitter Endings and you would like to hear more, please consider subscribing to this podcast and also leaving a review. Thanks so much and have an amazing and a safe day. I just want to take a quick minute to also acknowledge the music played in the Bitter Endings podcast. This song is called Disease Tree by Noya Sakamata.